hello, hello. I am Mayor Watt. This is hometown.com over there. And this is the hometown daily news show for October 19th, 2022. Uh, looks like you can see my tripod right there. Anyway, I'm working on another channel. As a matter of fact, whole channel altogether, pretty easy to, to find, uh, once I post it and hopefully everybody gets a kick out of it. Um, but it'll be housed in my office because it's basically a really small, <laughs> a small stream, small channel, and it doesn't take a human being to be on the, on the channel. At any rate, uh, let's get into today's news. I'm already 15 minutes late. I don't want to miss doing an episode. You'll be able to download this as a podcast or a VOD or over on YouTube as well. Um, yesterday's episode has, I've been really, really busy here in hometown. Um, so I wasn't able to uh, get around to doing everything that I'm supposed to do. Um, that said, let's get into today's news. I won't, man, I'm even going to mess up this. So at any rate, um, army plans, new $1 billion contract to move systems to cloud. Uh, if you've ever had to interact with any government, anything, uh, Seems like the everything is slow. Um, let's let's post this also into the chat. So the way that this works, a little side discussion here, is I created um, a connection to Showbot, and um, Nightbot notifies us that my submission was added. Showbot is the host, so if you hit exclamation Showbot. It'll tell you where to go, which is to hometown.showbot.tv, and you can vote on the articles that you find interesting. Pretty easy peasy, but come over and hang out with me, um, and we can talk about these articles. And if you find an article that you are interested in uh, me talking about, maybe giving some context to, it's really up to you, you too can do the exclamation point S and then the URL. Um, and um, you shouldn't have any problem with submitting it. Let me know. Uh, well, I'll, I'll see it if there's a problem, um, but I still get to see it anyway. Anyway, um, let's get back to the news. The The article is over in the Far Weekly channel, which is about federal, well, government contracting. That's what Far Weekly is all about, because I want to dispel some of the rumors and issues and a lot of complaints and Maybe misunderstandings, misperceptions about what government contracting is, but we can talk about some of that government contracting uh, like this. The forthcoming contract vehicle called the Enterprise Application Modernization and Migration uh, or EAMM, -E everybody in the government really loves their acronyms, um, is expected to be worth about $1 billion and the Army hopes to make an award by the end of June 2023. Dr. Raj Iyer, the Army Chief Information Officer, told uh, reporters Tuesday the service intends to structure the agreement in an indefinite delivery, indefinite quantity contract with spots for multiple vendors. Now, this will probably end up going to Microsoft and Amazon and Google, um, mainly because they are the ones that have the um, I don't know, chops, uh, past performance, uh, current performance of, uh, a cloud service provider. This probably will not go to small companies, um, mainly because they have to sit on the fence of doing, well, let's just say they have to provide the security that's necessary, um, to maintain the security of the army. Um, and, and that's probably going to be one of the major indicators as to who is going to be able to provide these services. There aren't many companies that can provide that level of cloud security. We'll see. We'll see because all of this gets announced. It's all public information eventually, but indefinite delivery, indefinite quantity means that there's basically Anytime 
anywhere, anyone. Um, although, well, there's some complexity here because indefinite delivery is kind of spooky. Um, you have to deliver in the contract year, so um, otherwise you might end up with anti-deficiency act issues. Um, right now, there's not a single contract they can go to, so they're doing a lot of shopping through multiple contracting centers to find the right vehicle, and it takes them nine months before they actually get on contract, he said. And if you wait, if you have to wait nine months, you're likely now in a new fiscal year and you don't have the money anymore. So we'll see how fast they can award. Um, usually sole source kind of thing. Um, and then it goes right to them because they've already determined that that, per that organization, that company can provide the services necessary to fulfill the contract. I guess we'll have to wait and see upwards of nine months. So this is over at Federal News Network. Jared Serbu is the author of this article. Um, this is pretty neat. They say it's a four minute read. I wonder what service provides that assessment. I'll have to take a look into this. This is more than one website that does this kind of thing. I think it's pretty neat. Um, if you don't want to go through all of this thing, it says last year the Army did uh, just that, which is Eiler said uh, it's simply not feasible or cost effective to find new homes for all of those um, systems and applications, so some will have to be killed off. Last year, the Army did just that with 66 separate systems, including two large enterprise resource planning systems. In 2023, the service aims to sunset another 103. The final decision on what to keep and what to kill are made by the Army Base, uh, sorry, Army Business Council, co-chaired by Iyer and Gabe Camarillo, or Camarillo, the Undersecretary of uh, the Army. Um, and a lot of this comes because it's a patchwork of systems that are designed by multiple contractors, something that um, has happened year after year. Somebody with, you know, a better widget comes along or somebody says, hey, let's go farm this out. And it exists for five years um, as something that's go to because somebody was contracted to create this product. Um, and it's patched into the system and everybody starts training on it and everybody starts using it. And then five years later, uh, another contract comes along that has to uh, do more patchwork. And then, well, now it's too old and it gets used, but not to its full extent. So they create another application and that adds on to that other application and it just becomes a nightmare. Um and I can get into all of this in some other way um, down the line when the Far Weekly channel gets a little bit more uh, produced and I start talking specifically about government contracting. But there is a serious limit on government. They can't just go reaching out and grab somebody um, who's advertising this, that or the other. They have to publicly request that somebody make a bid for a particular contract. And so their hands are tied. They, and if everybody says, well, for this particular product, we're going to charge you seven digits and all 10 random people who made a bid all sit around that $1 million mark. Guess what the competitive range is? It's $1 million. And everybody has a, a chance at that $1 million. And the government can't, and well, that's what I was about to say isn't necessarily true. The government can tell all of the contractors, sorry, a million bucks, you're out of your mind. But they don't have to capitulate and say, okay, well, we'll only charge you 500000 No, if they all say, no, screw you, I'm going to charge you a million dollars, guess what the government has to pay? They either don't get the contract filled and they terminate for convenience if a contract is put out there or if they they say well we're not just going to award it we're going to cancel that contract offer altogether guess what the solution doesn't get made and the next time the government asks hey anybody out there want to fill this contract guess what all of them are going to charge again a million dollars 
the government's hands are tied. They can't just ask everybody. They do in a way, but not everybody wants to jump through the flaming hoops of government contracting. And that's why it gets really expensive, not to mention the deep pockets. I'll move on to the next article. So I post these articles into chat and then you can just go over to Showbot and vote for the ones that you find interesting. And I'll keep it in mind when I go through the next 24 hours um, and see which ones are actually kind of popular and interesting. They could be popular, but if they're really not interesting, then I don't know if I'll actually grab them. It really depends on what's going on in my mind and, and what I see as something that could be a hot point discussion. Um, I wouldn't know if this one really is, but this one's in the mobile channel. And uh, uh, if you're aging, then, and we all are minute by minute, we're getting older. Um, at least five hours of sleep linked with lower health risks among seniors. So sleeping under five hours a night was associated with a greater risk of chronic health problems among those aged 50 or older, according to a new study that tracked individuals' health over 25 years. This is something that I have been told year after year that as you age, you need more sleep. But guess what gets impacted as you age? <laughs> Your sleep. When you get older, you sleep rougher and rougher. I mean, this is something that has been researched again and again. Um, and, and you just end up kind of just tossing and turning. You know, aches and pains and thoughts and things that you want to do and whatever else going on in the world. You end up waking up periodically throughout the night. And it's not necessarily five hours of you know, one long sleep. Now, yeah, it's sporadic. Anyway, as people get older, their sleep habits and sleep structure change. Gianna, I guess their name is Gianna Melillo over at the Hill and a thing called Changing America, Shared Destiny, Shared Responsibility. That's pretty bold. Um, that's according. So uh, sleeping five hours or less a night can increase seniors risk of developing multiple chronic uh, health conditions. That's according to a new study that was assessed data uh, from over a 25 year follow up period. And previous research has detailed the association between poor sleep and individual diseases, but less is known about the, its impact on multimorbidity, which that one is always such a scary word to hear, morbidity. Um, but you could have a bunch of illnesses that all riff off of each other and cause uh, uh, kind of a, a horrible degradation of quality of life. Um, but if you solve one issue, then, you know, it, it may pivot and, and kind of cascade a, a solution to others. You get good sleep and maybe the rest of your health conditions might improve a little bit of medicine here, a little bit of working out there, you know, stop drinking sugary drinks, Limit your caffeine, which, by the way, I found out that caffeine sits in your system for a tremendous amount of time. Even a small amount in the morning can impact your sleeping habits at night. I thought that one was really interesting. I had been told by someone pretty close to me that, um, and by close to me, I mean my wife, um, that, uh, and by close to me, I mean right over there. Anyway, um, so I was told, you know, I have a little bit of coffee and I am up all night. And guess what? Yeah, it turns out the research proves that. Um, individuals aged 50 years or, uh, sorry, 50 years old who got five hours or less of sleep each night had a 20% increased risk of being diagnosed with a chronic disease. Over 25 years, these adults were 40% more likely to be diagnosed with two or more chronic diseases. That refers to as uh, multimorbidity. And with, uh, are compared with seniors who slept up to seven hours each night. Well, I'm not a cat and I only sleep about two hours a night. So, I don't know. Maybe I'm completely screwed right now. I guess we'll see. 
Uh, diseases included cancer, diabetes, coronary heart disease, and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, among others. And for those with existing chronic conditions, sleeping longer was linked with a 35% higher risk of developing another condition. Interesting. For those with an existing chronic condition, sleeping longer was linked with a 35% higher risk. Why does that sound like it's the inverse of what this is saying? I'll have to look into it. Um, let's move on. That way, at least, you know, uh, I, we can get through the news and you can go on about your day or night. Um, but I'll look into that a little bit more and we'll come back to it. So the Biden administration approves a $2.8 billion uh kind of gold rush for EV battery and mineral production in the U S this is in the word in tech. I think that this is great. I don't know if we'll find it, but the U S department of energy is awarding $2.8 billion in grants from uh, the bipartisan infrastructure law to shore up domestic battery manufacturing and mineral production. The white house announced on Wednesday, the Biden administration is also launching a new government-wide initiative to strengthen supply chains to support electric vehicle manufacturing. I think that we need to concentrate on bolstering the energy grid as well. Um, I hope that is something that is fundamentally included in this. I don't recall finding uh, reading about that, but I haven't read everything. Um, it was the latest move by President Biden to support the shift from polluting gas-powered uh cars to emissions free electric vehicles with the goal of making 50% of all new cars sold in 2030 electric. And it comes as automakers, mining officials and environmentalists have sounded a warning mining officials. I don't know how that works. <clears throat> yes. I'm raising the alarm about my business polluting and doggone it. We should stop doing it. I mean, it's like the Speaker of the House way back. What's his name? I can't remember his name right now. Handing out tobacco checks on the floor of the house and, and saying, oh, I should stop doing that. It's it's really wrong. Yeah. Anyway, in order to meet the goal that 50% of new cars sold by 2030 are electric, the White House is authorizing a lot of money to shore up domestic EV battery production. Andrew J. Hawkins over at The Verge is the author of this um, article. So let's see if there's something else in here that might be interesting. The DOE grants will go out to 20 manufacturing and processing companies for projects across 12 states. That's pretty limited. According to the White House, those projects will support the production of enough lithium, graphite, and nickel to supply millions of new vehicle batteries annually. I hope so. Lithium is pretty much a big problem. See, now my problem is really in the macro sense of this. If you use the resources that are domestic, then they are no longer there. <laughs> if there is an emergency, like, I don't know, a global or near global war breaks out. Will that actually happen? I don't know. Let's find out how many sociopaths are running countries right now. Uh, how many leaders out there are chomping at the bit not to protect the uh, <laughs> democratically elected population, uh, de democratically elected leadership, um, and is seeking to invade another country Again, not to protect the democratically elected leader, but to, I don't know, take over the breadbasket of half the planet um, or annex a country uh, so that you have a warm water port. I'm trying to figure out how many are doing these invasion type of maneuvers. I'm not sure. Um, We'll have to do a vote. Maybe we can do a vote. I don't have mods, so I'd have to do the vote, and it takes a long time. So maybe another day. Um, let's hear it in chat um, or somewhere in the in a message. You can tell me how many psychopaths are running countries. 
Anyway, in addition, the money will be used to fund the construction of the first large-scale commercial lithium electrolyte salt production uh, facility in the U.S. Again, we use all of the domestic resources without, uh, instead of paying other countries to give us theirs, and we will never have it anymore. We'll use it all, and then we'll be screwed long-term. Just... Just to drive home the point, the United States can largely just kind of pull a Madagascar and and just lock us down, and we could pretty much survive on everything short of buying some cheap widget from somewhere else. We could pretty much survive on our own, but we don't because that's not the brightest thing to do you know, be xenophobic. Um, anyway, the DOE is also providing funding for an electrode binder facility and creating the first commercial scale domestic silicon oxide uh, production facility uh, to supply anode materials for an estimated 600,000 EV batteries annually. So, but for how long? It says annually, but for how long? This would, we would go through this EV battery thing pretty darn quick. Um, particularly if these EV batteries get 300 miles plus in range and um, don't have this kind of whichever way the wind blows type of efficiency when it comes to cold weather and heat. Uh, that heat and cold weather impact the performance of batteries. Um, so heat even more so than cold um, but at any rate i guess we'll see wow gosh you know the verge your auto load when you get close to the bottom of a page drives me nuts okay well let's go on to the next article uh, this next article is in the hatch ideas channel a live snake appeared in the business class section of a United Airlines jet terrifying passengers and eliciting people to say i'm tired of these MF, MFing snakes on this MFing United Airlines jet. Um, it was said so many times that the pilot turned the plane around and landed. Uh, United Airlines passengers spotted a snake in business class after the plane landed in Newark per reports. Some passengers shrieked and raised their legs when the snake made an appearance and all of them explain ex Exclaimed, pardon me, all of them exclaimed, what are you doing in business class? Get in the back. It was unclear how the snake ended up on the United flight. Oh, it, it turned out to be DeSantis. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I totally got all of that wrong here. Let, let's just go on to the source. Um, Kate Duffy from businessinsider.com is the author of this article and um if that was the snake it's kind of a tiny little snake um was it oh it's a garter snake oh my gosh come on this is what see maybe i should start reading the articles before i start talking about them because that's cute desantis is not anyway it's unclear how the snake ended up on the united flight i know because it doesn't have pockets so how could it afford the airfare and couldn't pay for it I don't know. I just don't know how this worked. The reptile was identified as a garter snake. The Port Authority said garter snakes, also known as grass snakes, are typically up to 66 centimeters long, non-venomous, and not dangerous to humans, according to Florida Museum of Natural History. He reached out to a subject matter expert for that, I'm sure. Thankfully, they are different. They are different from the snakes in the 2006 movie Snakes on a Plane, starring Samuel L. Jackson. I'm going to move on. I'm spending way too much time on this. Um, this next article is in the Hatch Ideas channel, and it says here uh, Bitcoin maintains $19,000 level, and IRS considers tax rule change to include NFTs, according to CNBC Crypto World. Um, CNBC Crypto World features the latest news and daily trading updates in the digital currency market. Now, this is a good segue for me because 
right now, the stock market for today went down meh, 100 off of uh, Dow Jones, S&P 500 down 25, NASDAQ down 92. Um, and Bitcoin, it trades pretty much all the time and it's at 19,182. 19,182. So I round up the 183, uh, but it's down 147 bucks uh, today. Um, for the month, it's down close to 400. For half the year, it's down $22,350. And uh, down for the year, 28550 Actually, year to date. So for the full year, it's down $45,117. So don't put all of your eggs in one Bitcoin. And gas is sitting here at 385. Now, what I have been talking about with gas over the months that I've been doing this, um, gas prices started to decline. But guess what didn't decline? Diesel. And you know what we need diesel for? everything other than driving people around. So that is, again, the leading indicator for me as to why the cost of everything is going up. The producers have to pay gas prices. The producers are the things that we get all of our goods from eventually, right? It ends up going through some processing and those goods end up in retail and we pay the price. So I've had this discussion with countless people. Um, and, uh, we are paying the price because oil and gas companies are greedy bastards. Yeah. I know that I'm not going to get a sponsorship from Exxon. I'm not expecting it. And, uh, that's fine. I'm fine with that. So what does that really have to do with Bitcoin? Well, when the price, when the stock market declines or the cost of goods increases, Bitcoin actually kind of wavers one way or the other. And when the whole world is starting to look at Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies as a taxable or controllable substance, yeah, it's going to suffer. And the moment that the U S federal government IRS in particular starts looking at it and, and finding a way uh, to police it, regardless of it being crypto and distributed and blah, 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 it is going to crash. And frankly, I think that it's going to happen and it's going to happen within the next two years. Um, people are making bank off of Bitcoin, but Bitcoin has no inherent value. It is a perceived value and it's tied entirely to the U S GDP. And, uh, I think the IRS is going to sit there and say, this is unearned income and we're going to tax it at 50%. <laughs> it's going to be taxed and it's going to lose its value. When you transfer it from Bitcoin ephemeral uh, value into real world dollars, because a Bitcoin's value is tied directly to us currency, you're going to start getting taxed like nobody's business. And policed. You tell somebody that you are doing Bitcoin trading and you're going to get audited. Let's move on to the next article. Um, by the way, I've, I've said it in the past. I'll say it again. I think the peak for uh, Bitcoin has passed. It will probably never get back to $25,000. Uh, not in the next decade. And... Um, uh, if you prove me wrong, then wonderful. Um, you know, I missed the original ride of this. I, I started Bitcoin mining when it was less than a penny. And uh, I bowed out because I figured eh, at some point it might gain traction, but I'm not going to sit there and ride this for 20 years. Yeah, mistakes were made, but I it doesn't change the, the nature of this. Um, I didn't think that it would be for me, an ethical currency. It's basically speculative and I'm not into speculation. I'm into the holistic value of a product and service that actually has merit to its valuation, not FOMO. 
Um, but that's me. That's just me. I know there's a lot of millionaires out there that are built off of fear of missing out and everybody's scrambling to get the next great thing. Uh, anyway, uh, the next article is uh, Intel's Thunderbolt 5 has twice the speed of Thunderbolt 4. This is in the Smack Talk channel. Intel has previewed an early prototype for its next generation Thunderbolt, showcasing faster speeds and improved external display uh, support. The next generation Thunderbolt will deliver 80 gigabits per second of bidirectional bandwidth, double that of Thunderbolt 4. The increased speed would be beneficial for transferring large files from one device uh, to the next. If you connect that to a Pico and it can actually handle data at Thunderbolt speeds, VR would be spectacular. Anyway, uh, Intel says that it will be that it will dynamically enable up to 120 gigabits of bandwidth for external displays, which is three times higher than that of its predecessor. It doesn't need to travel backwards, so it doesn't need to be bidirectional um, for a TV or well, for a display. Um, this will allow for 8K HDR displays with lower latency, ideal for creative professionals and gaming enthusiasts. Thank you. I can't wait for the next generation of VR headset. Hopefully my Pico is on the way. Hey, uh, the reseller that I bought it from, um, could you tell me if it's actually sitting on the shelf waiting to get shipped at least? Uh, I mean, it's been a whole day since it was announced and I'm twitching over here already. I, twitching as in the yeah, in a jerky motion, not twitching. I am twitching on twitch.tv as well. Never mind. Anyway, Amber Neely is the author of this um, article over at appleinsider.com. And um, I'm going to kind of post, I'm, I'm going to state their little brag flex here. Intel has always been the industry pioneer and leader for wired connectivity solutions. And Thunderbolt is now the mainstream port on mobile PCs and integrated into three generations of Intel mobile CPUs. We're very excited to lead the industry forward with the next generation of Thunderbolt built on the USB 4 V2 specification. Advanced to this next generation by Intel and other USB promoter group members. This is uh, Intel's general manager of client connectivity, Jason Ziller, who said that statement. Look, I hate cables, but one cable to rule them all. Yeah, I can dig that. I can I can cope with that. Right now, if you were to look behind everything that's in front of me, it is just a, a waterfall of cables. And I would love to just daisy chain one USB-C cable to all of the monitors that I have. In fact, I'd rather just use VR. Um, but then when you're looking at me from the camera, all you would see is my VR headset. Anyway, I really don't like monitors. I really don't like cables. I don't like any of this stuff. I, I want, I want it to be nothing. When I take off my glasses, I want it to be nothing, not just a blurry mess. Now the glasses are on and I can see again. At any rate, in addition to increased speeds, next-gen Thunderbolt provides support for newly released DisplayPort 2.1, which is two uh, times the PCI Express data throughput and is backward compatible with previous versions of Thunderbolt USB and DisplayPort. Beautiful. Backward compatibility is um, something that I thoroughly enjoy because then I can move forward but not necessarily immediately have to spend thousands of dollars on new equipment. Um, let's go on to the next article. So this next article is help. I'm obsessed with this skeleton cauldron candle. I have not seen this, but I was just kind of enthralled with the title of this. Uh, this person says when their sister got engaged, their dad asked them, what about you? Are you, or are there any uh, guys that you like? And they said that something along the lines of, yeah, there are a lot of guys that they like, but what I should have said was yes, but no one compares to him. The skeleton in a cauldron jacuzzi candle from Amazon. Yes, I just said all that. 
Okay, that's fascinating. So he is grace. He is sex. Most of all, the spooky skeleton candle is the love of my life, says Mary Frances Frankie Knapp from New York. Uh, this is from vice.com rec room shopping by vice. <laughs> they just like to throw titles together, I think. Anyway, it's a skeleton cauldron candle and uh, the candle is burning and there is a a skeleton sitting in a wax cauldron and i guess when it warms up i wonder if he slowly melts away too um and this is such a quirky wonky story to tell just to get that joke out that they dig this candle anyway it is reasonable to expect that a candle should burn but this one goes above and beyond with its cauldron set up burning with the hellfire passion of a thousand satans Okay, I said that too. That's what they said. I'm just repeating a little bit of their article. I don't read the whole thing. Anyway, he's starting to get so popular that folks have even started making DIY versions on TikTok and Instagram. Yep. That's how it works. <sighs> the moment somebody comes up with something cool and it's $23 at Amazon, somebody else will start creating it. And they'll be selling it for 15. Yeah. You can't protect an idea, by the way, folks. Not even through litigation. Let's move on to the next article. There really isn't much to that last one. But it's cool. Go get the candle if you can. AI is changing scientists' understanding of language learning and raising questions about innate grammar. This is in the word in tech. Unlike the carefully scripted dialogue found in most books and movies, the language of everyday interaction tends to be messy and incomplete, full of false starts, interruptions, and people talking over each other. Yep, that's how I actually construct my emails. Uh, from casual conversations between friends to bickering between siblings to formal discussion in a boardroom, authentic conversation is chaotic. It seems miraculous that anyone can learn language at all, given the haphazard nature of the linguistic experience. See, but that's not true. I mean, we actually teach language by uh, kind of staccato construction. You say this, you say this, you say this, you translate it into this language and you put your own idiomatic whatever's into it. Um, it's very specific. You learn the words, you learn the phrasing, the syntax. It, it, it's not as broken up as what that just said not until you are fluent in it does it become kind of crazy in how people talk um, and that's all built off of comfort if you aren't comfortable with a particular spoken language and there's somebody that's rattling off dialogue you tend to miss a whole lot catch specific words every once in a while or ask them to slow down so that you can play catch up Morton H. Christensen and Pablo Contreras Collins from The Conversation uh, wrote this article over at phys.org. And it says, for this reason, many language scientists, including Noam Chomsky, a founder of modern linguistics, uh, believe that language learners require a kind of glue to rein in the unruly nature of everyday language. And that glue is grammar, a system of rules for generating grammatical sentences. Children must have a grammar template wired into their brains to help them overcome the limitations of their language experience, or so the thinking goes. This template, for example, might contain a superglue that dictates how new pieces of, uh, are added to existing phrases, and children then only need to learn whether their native language is one, like English, where the verb goes before the object, as in I eat sushi, or one like Japanese, where the verb goes after the object, in Japanese, the same sentence is structured, I sushi eat. But new insights into language learning are coming from an unlikely source, AI. Artificial intelligence, a new breed of large AI language models, can write newspaper articles, poetry, computer code, answer questions truthfully after being exposed to vast amounts of language input. And even more astonishingly, they do it all without the help of grammar. That's because they actually learn the grammar syntax from all of the language that they're intaking that has to be how it is i mean 
There's no other way. It learns simply because it has been told to learn the way that language is being expressed within its library. Even if their choice of words is sometimes strange, nonsensical, or contains racist, sexist, and other harmful biases. By the way, the reason why I say all of that is because it's actually in the article and it they have a reason to do that because they're linking it to some other article about Twitter. Um, or it's on Twitter and it's an open mind tweet, which is a, I think it's a um, artificial intelligence that was modified by people sending it messages on Twitter. Anyway, one thing is very clear. The overwhelming majority of the output of these AI language models is grammatically correct. And yet there is no grammar templates or rules hardwired into them. No, that's not true. They're hardwired in by the very input of the data. If we were to take uh, Japanese translated into English with its grammar, then the output of these AIs would be the same translated Japanese into English. Ta-da! Uh, that it has to be. It just has to be that way. They learn from what they are being fed, so they are grammatically correct, or arguably borderline gra grammatically correct, because they are fed grammatically correct content. Uh, again, if you feed them information, they spit back it out that information without truly knowing what it means. They just know that that's the answer. That's what needs to be said because they've been trained to. They don't it, know like a human being knows what a word means, even from context clues, even from actually even tertiary things, meanings to it. You know, if you say that you're hungry, hungry doesn't necessarily mean exactly what it means. It means I want to go and get some food and I'm really craving this food and it makes me feel like this and all kinds of other context to what that word means. I'm hungry or hungry, I should say. But a, an AI doesn't know that. It has no emotion. It has no feelings. It just exhibits it, that response. It, it executes a string from its programming. So you train it to speak a certain way and it will spit back out everything that you've trained it on in that certain way. So... This article goes a lot deeper than what I am talking about, uh, saying the similarity of uh, with human language doesn't stop here. However, research published in Nature Neuroscience demonstrated that these artificial deep learning networks seem to use the same computational principles as the human brain. The research group led by neuroscientist Har uh, Yuri Hassan first compared to how well GPT-2, a little brother of GPT-3, and humans could predict the next word in a story taken from the podcast, This American Life. People with the AI, or people and the AI, predicted the exact same word nearly 50% of the time. That's because the AI is trained on the human. It's not trained on a vacuum. It's trained off of what the human would say and do. The researchers recorded volunteers' brain activity while listening to the story. The best explanation for the patterns of activation they observed was that people's brains, like GPT-2, were not just using the preceding one or two words when making predictions, but relied on the accumulated context of up to 100 previous words. I don't know how they're extracting that from neurons firing in a brain, but okay. Altogether, the authors conclude, our findings of spontaneous predictive neural signals as participants listen to natural speech suggests that active prediction may underlie a human's lifelong learning, uh, language learning. I, that's a, okay. I love science, but <clears throat> I guess the objective here is to scientifically state what a lot of people seem to know, but apparently you're not allowed to say you know it unless it's scientifically proven and you've read it in a journal. Let's move on to the next article. 
the next article article is in the hatch ideas channel uh tesla sales climb but miss expectations that's because tesla is wildly out of line with what it should be valued at that's okay one second please Oh, wow. Um, I think my music died. Let's try this again. I'm trying to have, what the heck is going on here? I want us to have scary music. There we go. There, now we got music, scary music back. And just in time for Tesla. Okay, so let's click this link. I'll just play catch up here. And um, we don't have too many articles left, but we'll play catch up anyway. Um, Tesla sales climb, but miss expectations. This is an article over at bbc.com. Uh, let's see if there's an author. I don't see an author. Anyway, supply shortages, logistic bottlenecks, and rising costs are hitting Tesla as it ra rapidly ramps up production of its electric cars. While the problems have improved in recent months, they remain immediate uh, challenges, Tesla said in a financial update for investors. Revenue was lower than expected in the three months ending in September as car sales fell short of expectations, but at almost $21.5 billion, it remained more than 50% higher than a year ago. Tesla, led by billionaire Elon Musk, <sighs> has been growing aggressively in recent years, opening few factories in, or new factories in the U.S., China, and Germany, and boosting output. The company delivered 343,000 cars in the quarter. Uh, the record was up more than 40% from the same period last year. The firm produced more cars than were sold raising fears that demand may be slowing as rising prices, higher borrowing costs, and a major economic slowdown in the key China market discourage buyers. Yeah, I believe so. Uh, deliveries of its much-anticipated electric truck are due to start in December, the firm said. The company reported $3.3 billion in profit, up significantly from a year ago, but questions about Tesla's growth path as well as billions of dollars in stock sales by Mr. Musk as he prepares a $44 billion takeover of Twitter have weighed on the company's shares in recent months. And I'm telling you, if he buys Twitter and tries to make it the bastion of free speech while still blocking people, yeah, Twitter is going to die on the vine. And I hope that a lot of competitors pop up and say, hey, let's do this. Let's do that. Make it add another layer, add some competition, um, something and and just neuter it. The, the moment that Musk takes over, maybe he'll sell it back for half the price just to cut his losses. Imagine that. Anyway, we'll see what happens. Um, but Tesla kind of took a hit well, and you know what let's do something real quick what what is tesla trading at um dun 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 so in five days the only hit it took was to its reputation um i don't think anybody cares frankly i think tesla is irrational exuberance incarnate but that's okay Oh, incarnate. Get it? Anyway. Um, the next article is over in the Reality Hacker channel. And that is uh, Unreal Engine's Unreal Engine 5's new rendering tech is beginning to make VR look starting startlingly real. Um, I love the idea of what Unreal Engine 5 is bringing to the table. Um, Games are going to look spectacular. Software development for it is going to look spectacular. Um, and now VR, as well as extensions to games that are not VR ready, can now be even more realistic as Unreal Engine allows you to... Well, there are mods that pull anything developed in Unreal into a 3D world. 
into a VR world, I should say. Unreal Engine 5 brings two key features which stand to radically improve the realism of both 3D geometry and lighting. While the features aren't fully optimized for VR, early developer uh, experiments are showing impressive results. I'm just going to click this link and take us straight over uh, to the source. And that is roadtovr.com and uh, has some pretty amazing pictures. I'm going to have to upgrade my video card, I guess. Oh, gosh. And let's see. Um, a drone and everything else or just a video card uh, decisions decisions anyway it's hard to justify 1500 bucks for a video card I, I i've never been able to in the past i don't think i can now ben lang over at road to vr.com wrote this article and it said unreal engine 5 launched earlier this year but unfortunately it's two new key features lumen for global illumination lighting and nanite for microgeometry weren't supported for VR out of the gate. Nanite is very impressive, by the way. If you've not seen demo demonstrations of it, you should go and check out uh, YouTube. Just do a search for Nanite and um, Unreal Engine 5. However, Epic has been working on subsequent versions of Unreal Engine 5, and uh, though they aren't ready for a full release yet, preview builds of Unreal Engine 5.1 and 5.2 show that Lumen and Nanite have gained initial support for VR. Uh, it's just going to be amazing. I don't want to play any video of it. Um, I'm going to uh, wait for a more uh, public release. Just everything associated with graphics with Unreal Engine 5 um, are just kicked up a notch. So um, go over to Road to VR and uh, subscribe to them. Just, just follow them. Uh, whatever they're talking about, that's pretty much the go-to. They they do some really cool articles and, and talking about the hardware and stuff like that. So I'm going to do this last article um, and get out of here. And if you want to see me tomorrow and we can talk about all of this kind of stuff and others, the last 24 hours of news, I am going to be readily available uh, tomorrow at 6 p.m. Uh, judge, this article, uh, it's only this one little title. I don't have everything else. Um, judge is removed after she is accused of presiding in a matter. Sorry, this is a quote, <laughs> so it, it made me stumble. Judge is removed after she is accused of presiding, quote, in a manner befitting a game show host. <laughs> Rather arbitrary and capricious. Uh, Deborah Kessens Weiss, who does this great article writing, um, is the writer for this uh, ABAjournal.com article. And uh, like always, I don't read the whole thing. Judge Pinky Suzanne Carr apparently is the, the subject of this. The Ohio Supreme Court suspended a Cleveland municipal judge after hearing a panel concluded that she, quote, ruled her courtroom in a reckless and cavalier manner. It's arbitrary and capricious in some way. Uh, and conducted business in a manner befitting a game show host. In an October 18th opinion, the Ohio Supreme Court uh, indefinitely suspended Judge Pinky Suzanne Carr from the practice of law and immediately removed her from judicial office without pay. She must remain off the bench during her practice suspension. Carr has been a Cleveland municipal, municipal judge since January 2011. Apparently, after 10 years, you just kind of phone it in. Before that, she was an assistant prosecuting attorney for Cuyahoga, I guess, Cuyahoga County, Ohio. Um, and the Ohio Supreme Court said Carr had used holidays and birthdays as reasons to waive court fines and costs, had issued warrants for the arrest of defendants for missing hearings that she never told them about, had ignored an order to reschedule cases because of COVID-19, and had worn inappropriate outfits to court that included spandex shorts and t-shirts with slogans. Uh, do you wear robes? You probably wouldn't see any of that. The Ohio Supreme Court said Carr's ethical misconduct fell into these categories. Issuing warrants and making false statements, engaged in ex parte communications, improper pre plea, garden, plea gardens, plea bargaining, and arbitrary uh, dispositions in 34 cases. 34 cases. Improperly using warrants and bonds to compel payment of fines and costs. Wow, she's like a bounty hunter. 
lack of decorum and dignity consistent with judicial office, yeah. abusing contempt power and failing to recuse. Carr later admitted that she abused her discretion by charging a defendant with contempt for rolling her eyes in court and cursing in the lockup. She also admitted that she acted in a rude and discourteous manner and instigated the incident that led to her led her to cite the defendant for contempt a second time. She did not recuse herself from the contempt case. <laughs> wow. You're hitting it out of the park there, Carr. Congratulations. Um, anyway, that is the last article for today. Again, this is the hometown daily news show for October 19th, 2022. I will see you tomorrow. Maybe if you hear, if you you hear my voice and you show up over at, uh, hometown, man, twitch.tv slash hometown, or you go to hometown.com, um, and read all the articles, make a post, become a citizen, go over to YouTube and watch one of those. Uh, follow me there. I really don't have many followers over there. Um, I mostly hang out on on Twitch. That's kind of my bag. I'm really interested in the in in Twitch. Um, so if you are here, thank you very much for lurking, and I'll see you tomorrow. Bye bye.